So welcome back. Uh, we are here at our second talk. Uh, I am uh, very happy to introduce Barbara Giunti, uh, whose main he he's, she's now postdoc in, uh, in Graz. Um, her main works uh, are, uh, of course, in computational topology, split it into theoretical parts and uh, computational parts. Uh, today we will focus more most on the computational side and uh, on the algorithm that he, that is behind all uh, the scenes uh, in uh, all the works in uh, TDA, basically. <laughs> so the stage is yours. Thank Please. you very much. So thank you very much to the organizer. I'm happy to be in Rome and I'm happy to meet the, the machine learning community. So today I'm going to talk about barcode algorithms. So basically, what Bastian left outside. So I'm very happy we didn't we didn't coordinate it, but it worked out marvelously. Um, so in this talk, we're going to talk about a lot of different works. Many of them are in the literature. Many of them are with some co-author of mine, and I will point it out from time to time. Uh, so, what I'm going to talk about today is basically the interplay between this combinatorial object and this object that maybe are not so familiar with, which is an intervasphere. And I'm going to define it uh, in a second. So, let's get started with the motivation. Okay, this is the pipeline of consistent theory, mostly. So, if you want to do machine learning, you start on the right of here. Uh, what we do usually is we start with data. And we built a filtered complex that I'm not going to specify yet what type of complex. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about this arrow today. What I want you to know is just we have mathematical guarantees that the topological information in this here is preserved by this, this arrow, which is I mean, an important step. And then what I'm going to focus today is how to get from the filtered complex to the barcode, which is, are you familiar with what a barcode is? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Then I'm going to go fast on that. Uh, so, how to get from one to the other. Okay, and this is a little bit of advertising. Uh, together with Jan Lazowski, we are taking care of a, a database of real world application of TA. So, when someone asks you why, why do we actually need it, you have over 300 applications for it. So, that's quite a lot. Uh, maybe for this audience, we have the word machine learning quite a lot, both in the sense of applications. So using TDA to study, uh, to, to improve machine learning method, for example, understanding what is the network, how is the encoding behind, but also together, so more, more what Bastian talked before, uh, combining TDA method and machine learning method. Okay. And if you have comments or you want to see this, this is fully exportable, so you can uh, read it and copy and such. Okay. Let's go. Oh, boundary matrix. How familiar? Uh, I welcome questions. So if you have, just interrupt me. How familiar are you with synthesis and such? Sure. Very good. Okay. Then you know what is an M simplex. You know what is a simplicial complex. Very good. What is a boundary matrix? That is, for example, this one. So I'm going to have, I'm on zeta 2 all the time, just to make things easier. So I'm going to have 1 because A is in the boundary of AB and such. Very good. I'm very happy that I can sleep on this one. Uh, for <laughs> uh, I simply have a nested sequence of simplicial complexes, and then I'm going to have the boundary matrix, which is basically the boundary matrix of this last one. Okay. So, and uh, I encoding the information of the ordering of uh, so the who entered before in the order of the columns and the rows. Okay, so far so good. Chain complex. Also here we're fine. I'm so happy. Uh, okay, so homology. This I, I prepared this talk not knowing how much math the, the audience was gonna have, so I'm gonna keep many of the definition at a high level just to give you the idea and if you want the details are you gonna have plenty of reference for the paper and such okay so the two that i'm very interested in those are well okay the sphere what i call a sphere so this is a chain complex of the type of a sphere because you can see the homology is clearly the same or a disk okay and now the reason why i'm interested in that is because when i have a filtration okay 
Then it decomposes uniquely into a diagram of interval spheres that I haven't defined it yet. I know, but I'm going to tell you. And here I'm being slightly emphasized because I told you about the filtration as simplicial complexes. And what we are actually decomposing is the uh, filtered chain complex, the associated one. Why it is interesting and why I want you to focus on this is that when we say that we compute the barcode, we don't compute the barcode. We compute the decomposition into interval spheres because the interval sphere are to have the two generator, one that gives me the birth time of the bar, one that gives me the death time. And why it is important because all the argument that, we're gonna, that we have, all the argument that I want to talk about today, work on the boundary matrix, work on the filter chain complex, okay? Not on the persistent module. This is an interval sphere. So let's you can imagine that you have the generator of your synthesis, okay? And then, okay, you're going to have also, for example, the generator of the edge. And what the algorithm is doing is telling me which one, which are paired together, okay? So what is happening here is that I'm saying that B is giving birth to a connected component that get killed when I have the edge AB, okay? Do the same with triangles and the whole goal the whole point of of uh, persistent algorithm or barcode algorithm is telling me okay this a b is matching so it's pairing with b and not with a this t is pairing with with a and not something else okay okay and the reason why i call it interval spheres is because they look like a sphere so a chain complex in an interval so I have a sphere, a chain complex type of sphere in here, and then it got killed by a disk, and then it keeps forever. Okay? So this is the decomposition that you are actually doing with the persistent barcode. Okay. How does this pairing work? So I'm going to have my two synthesis. I'm going to have my one synthesis here. And I would like to know, for example, is it true that the simplex AC is paired with the simplex ACB? So which means that I have this is the generator that gives me the birth time. This is the generator that gives me the death time. The object that I use to pair them is the combinatorial object that I presented before, which is the boundary matrix. How do I read that? And in this slide, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do slightly backward with what happened in the literature. Okay, but the idea is that I want to study what happens. So how does the homology change? Okay, so when I arrive up to here, I know that this triangle is not, not yet there, right? Because I'm missing the edge AC. So if I look just up to here, I don't have it. So I want to know what happens if that edge is the one that gives me birth to something, or, if something, or it is an edge that comes later. But I also want to know what happened up to this triangle. So what I'm going to study is I'm going to study the lower left matrix given by including this, this edge and this triangle, or excluding this edge but having this triangle, excluding the triangle and having the edge, and then remove the other. And how do I study them? I study the rank of these matrices. So I'm going to take the, one, the rank of the total one minus the rank of these two halfway, and then I have to put back whatever I remove it twice, so I'm putting back the rank of the last one, okay? Now, this pairing, okay, so, sorry, the result is that, that it was already in the very beginning of, of topology, is that I have a pairing if and only if this sum is one. So, for example, here I have that the rank of this big one is one, minus the rank uh, zero, minus one, and then plus a zero, so the rank is zero. This is not a pairing because, as a matter of fact, AC is paired with AB. Okay. Now, why am I presenting you in this way? Well, the reason is that in this paper, the author used that used this this relation of the rank to prove that their reduction method is the correct one because it preserved this pairing. But I want you to go home remembering that actually it is the other way around. Anything that preserves this run 
is a good persistent algorithm. Okay. Okay. So, and the reason why, sorry, I forgot to say, but the reason why we want to reduce this matrix is that here I cannot really read the information. Where is the pairing here? I want to remove a series of elements that are just disturbing until I can read easily the barcode from there. So far, so good? Okay. So, remember this. Any reduction that preserves this rank is, is fine. And now let's start with the the standard one, again, from the very beginning. And this is basically the one, almost the one that is implemented all over. So I start with my boundary matrix, okay? And then I run over the columns, so from the very first column to the last one, and then I check if the lowest element, the index of the lowest element in that column was already there in the matrix, because low is the index of the lowest one zero element, then I add the column, okay? And if it works, and then I keep doing it until I exhaust it, okay? So let's, let's understand it with an example. This is a boundary matrix of a complex that I'm not going to show you, but you can trust me, it is actually a boundary matrix. So I start with this column, and this column has the lowest index here in the last, in the last row, and it is unique because, come on, it's the first one. So I'm going to go to the second one, the second one has a low weight in, the, uh, in, this, in this row, it is unique, and I keep doing it until I get here, okay? This has a lowest non-zero element that is in the same row as the previous one. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take this column and add it to this column here, okay? Just like this. But I ha I'm not done, because now I check again, okay, what is the lowest, what is the index of the lowest element, it is the same of this of these other columns, the second one, and I'm gonna keep doing it. And again, at the end, I get here. Okay, this is finally unique, and those so up to here they are unique. Afterwards, you can see that they are not. So I'm gonna add this column to all of them, and that's it because this element here are gonna prevent anything else. So at the end of the day, this is my reducing matrix, and I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read the pairing with this lowest non-zero element. So I'm going to have that I know that this simplex, so the simplex corresponding to this row is the one that got paired with the, index, the simplex corresponding to this column. Actually with the chain, because after I'm doing some addition, this is a chain and not exactly a simplex. Okay? Okay. This, yes? Is there a way to think about it, like, visually what's happening when you're adding these boundary columns together? Uh, yes, yes, there is, and I'm actually going to refer to someone else for that. Uh -huh. um, there is, in the AATRN uh, group, there has been this um, tutorial on, which is very good. I, I strongly suggest either to participate in or to watch them. And there is a marvelous video of Teresa Heiss in which mm -hmm. she explains and exactly what's, what's going on, what is this. She does it a great job in 15 minutes, so I'm not going to try <laughs> to do better than that. Okay. Okay, so this is good. And as you can see, oh, sorry. As you can see, I'm, I'm doing some column operation. At the end, I'm going to have these lowest elements that are unique. So this should recall in your mind as this is a Gaussian elimination. This is a Gaussian elimination in which we are not allowed to do all the, all the possible uh, operation, but still it is the same, which means that the complexity is cubic, or better, let's say that I have, you know, I take in the minimum between the row and the column, and it is the minimum square times the other, okay, so if, if I'm going to have n and n elements, I'm going to have n squared times n, which means n cubic, okay, so it's good, it could be n p hard, but Still, we've, when you have like thousands of points, it's getting, it's getting and like you cannot, you cannot do much after a certain degree. So we want to do better. So the, the intuition that you can have now, because I was talking about interval sphere, is that interval spheres comes with two generators, right? And once you have the pairing for one, you actually don't need to, to study the other, because you already have the pair, which means that if we find the upper generator, let's say, then we can remove the lower, and 
this has been disappeared like 11 years ago without his intuition of intervasphere. So I think they did some magic for understanding what was going on uh, in persistent homology computation with a twist of channel cover. And this is called the clear. So you are clearing a column before doing any column operation. And on the other hand, if we find the lower, then you can remove the upper, and this is being called the compressed optimization. OK? Um, so far, so good? Perfect. Okay. Now, another trick that we can do to do better is observing the relation between, I mean, talking about the co-boundary. So the boundary, I'm assuming that you are familiar also with the co-boundary if you work with the boundary which is just the reverse. Instead of taking all the synthesis uh, that are in the, sorry, if I have a simplex, instead of taking all the subsynthesis, I'm taking all the simplices that have that as a subsynthesis. And as an observation again from 2011, which apparently was a very profitable year, we have that the antitranspose is almost the same, is because there you have to talk about absolute and relative homology and homology, but Still, the important thing is that we can pass from one to the other. Okay, so you may decide if you have many, 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 many columns and few rows, you may take the anti transpose and then you end up with a lot of rows but only few columns. And since we are going by column operation, you want to have the fewest possible. Okay, and what has been proven and observed several times in this paper, but also in the roadmap paper, in the FAT paper, I mean, all over, is that. On some input, which read especially the autorial strips, the standard barcode algorithm, so what I presented, with the clear optimization, is much more efficient than on the boundary matrix. Like, much. Hmm? On the anti transpose. Uh, on the co boundary. Yeah. So, on the anti transpose. I mean, the co boundary is the transpose, not the anti transpose. Uh, now you have to remember, sorry, you have to remember the, the entrance time. So you have to anti-transpose to do things correctly. It's, uh, it's a knowledge of work. Yeah, yeah, okay, anyway. Yes, anyway, on the anti-transpose. Okay, what is interesting is nothing like that happened for the compressed optimization. Okay, so this, this puzzled people a little because, come on, one should be the dual of the other, right? It's so clear. And then we have the boundary commander in there, one of the opposite of the other. So what is missing? Well, what is missing is that we are doing column operation. And what I told you is it's important that whatever algorithm we're using, it does remember the rank of the lower left sub matrices. The algorithm was working with the lowest non-zero element. Why shouldn't we work it with the leftmost? non-zero element is still preserving the same rank, right? This is the basic algorithm that appeared here and slightly later or I mean I wasn't I wasn't aware of this paper when I worked on the on the pivot pairing, but still the observation is that you can put the compress here, you can add it here, and then you are really dualizing. It's really the same thing. So if you do column operation it should be here, okay. If you do column operation with the clear on the anti-transpose, you get the same number of operation that if you do row operation compressed on the on the original matrix. So this lack of symmetry that was disturbing the mathematician was not a lack of symmetry. It was that there were three things that needed to be dualized and we were dualizing only two of them. Okay. It's like CPT in physics. Hmm? It's like CPT in, in physics. Yes, you have to remember <laughs> all of them. Okay. Uh, good. I promise in the title that I tell you where to find them. So I, here there is a list of where to find the sum of the algorithm. Uh, Goody is probably the one that has more feature because it's just enough that you can compute only the system cohomology that's there. Uh, but you can also construct a different type of, um, of uh, synthesis, and you have also to compute. You can compute the bottleneck, you can compute the Wasserstein. So you, uh, there are many things. Uh, fact is 
is a little strange in the sense that it requires as an input not to point cloud but the boundary matrices, but it has something like, I don't know, eight different ways to reduce the boundary matrix. So we're going to use it later to compare many of them. We observed that one job which is work with the Tori strips, and it does it marvelously. As a matter of fact, Jopto is based on, on the Ripser and it's basically combining some of the powerful pink Ripser on its own plus something of goody. And if you want to compare this on, there is this paper that is happened yesterday, let's say that they happened yesterday. And uh, uh, I mean, there are many, it's like Jopto PH is on there because Jopto PH came afterwards, but still, it is a good comparison paper uh, to understand uh, who which algorithm does what. Okay. Another thing that I want you to remember, this is very, very, very important and often often does pass passes under the radar, is that the choice of how to store the boundary matrix has a big impact. Huge. Because the matrix is initially sparse. And if I remember a kilometric vector of zero and one, then I'm gonna lose a lot, a lot of memory. Because at the beginning, I'm just going to have, I don't know, in a, in a column that may be very long, I'm going to have three non-zero entries. So if I remember only the indices of this non-zero entry, it's much better than remembering all this kilometric zero and one. Okay. Uh, and the size, I mean, the, this is, it is important also because when we are adding two columns, okay, the number of non-zero entry in the column that I'm adding is giving me the number of bit flip that I'm gonna do. Okay. Because especially on, on zeta one. Because if if in this column I I have a non-zero element, then I'm gonna go to the column J and I'm gonna see if it is a one, one plus one zero, and so I turn it, and if it is a, a zero, then I'm gonna put it one. So this is the number of really bit flip operations that my computer is doing. And so the cost of matrix reduction, that is basically how many times I'm adding columns, because this is the ma major subject thing that we are doing, it is the number of okay. uh, And then I'm going to introduce this, this name that is going to come up uh, later, which is how many entries do I get at the end? Because one of the problem in, in computational uh, theory, in um, complexity theory, to understand the complexity of the Gaussian elimination is that you cannot say how many elements are, how much the operation, how much a, a single column operation is uh, increasing the sparsity or, or decreasing the sparsity of, of your matrix. If you could bound that, and there are some work to do that, then you can understand much better and you can improve the complexity. But for now, it's, it's still very difficult, which is impressive because the Gaussian elimination is quite low. Okay, so the example that I computed before, okay, it was actually a trick already because you can see that we started with something that it was not so bad, but here I already have many ones, right? And if the cost of, if the efficiency depends on how many bit flip I do, maybe I want to have a sparser matrix at the end, right? Maybe I want to work and tweak the persistent algorithm, the barcode algorithm, such that I have a much sparser matrix at the end. We started doing that. This paper should appear. It is under submission, but uh, we haven't put it on the archive yet. But anyway, it, it's there. Uh, so this is almost the same that I had before. The only change is here. So what I'm saying is that if I have two columns, and if I have column J and column and column I, and I need to add column I to column J, okay, maybe I first check which one is the sparser. And if column J is the sparser, I first swap them, and then I do the operation. So here there is the boundary matrix that we had before. Everything was fine up to when I arrived here, and then I had to add this one to all the others. But let's not do that. Let's take this one that has many one, and this one that has only two, swap them, and then do the computation. And at the end, when I do the reduction, this is the only dense one, and this is the end. So you can see that the pairing of the pivot here is the same, but this is much lighter. Okay. So we have several. Okay. Uh, we have 
several actually methods or different because the idea once we figured out that uh, because sorry historically you always go by column operation already coming up with row operation it was something a little weird so I work I working with with Michael that cover that he was here from the very beginning and he's still a little puzzled every time I mention row operation <laughs> something weird now I knew um, but I mean he implemented it so it doesn't have a problem with that but it's just weird to think about it. And then we figured out that, okay, every reduction that remember the rank of the lower left submatrix is fine. And then we started playing around a lot. So even in this retrospective barcode algorithm, we do some backward operations. So we take some column that appear later and we add it to something that appeared before. It's when, when we told the uh, admin, Herbert Edisburg, that it was, what are you doing? I'll be there. Uh, but it was fun. Um, I mean, he saw it before we finished the installation, of course, while it was fun. But, yeah. um, okay, so what we do here, that when we have, this is basically the usual reduction, so we check the lowest element, but then every time we have a lowest non-zero element, we add it everywhere else where it is non-zero. And then we check it first, forward, and then backward. So let me come back to the example because I think it's much easier. Okay, so the first column, okay, it has nothing that has the same non-zero element before, but it has something that has the same non-zero element afterwards. So we are already making this operation because, come on, and we, we need to do it anyway. And then we are done. Then we come back here, and this is where things start to get weird. So this lowest element here, it has the same it has a non-zero element in the same row here, but also in the same row here. So I'm going to add it forward and backward. Okay. And then I'm going to do the same here. Here I have actually two operations that I need to do, three operations, because I needed to add it backward here, forward, forward. At the end of the day, this is the reducive matrix. You can see on this example that it doesn't always sparsify the most. <laughs> But it does some work. Now, this is quite overwhelming, but let's go through it. So we tested using the FAT paper, uh, the FAT uh, algorithm, uh, on three different types of inputs. And we are computing how much sparse, how sparser the, the reduced matrix gets, how many column operations we did to reduce the matrix, how many bit flip at the end. And then you can see that, for example, the, the swap algorithm Okay, it's doing a good job in sparsifying most, but the retrospective is doing even better unless we do a lie. So we take the, the anti transpose. And here there is a strategy that I haven't um, told you before, but is we were curious because we say, okay, if the idea is the sparser, the better. What if during the reduction we just remember which combination was the sparser and we put that there? So this is a mixed strategy because we are mixing the things around. We are just taking whatever is the best. And you can see that it's doing a fairly good job in keeping the magic sparse. Yeah. Terrible job in efficiency. Like very, very bad. How many column operations? That's, that's like 10 times more. Let's not mention the number of big clips. So we were very surprised because apparently this barcode algorithm, it is so simple that they can write it down in five lines, still it, it doesn't it doesn't follow simple rule like this sparse at the best. It's five line is already so complicated that we cannot really figure it out what is the best sparsifying strategy. It's, I'm amazed by it. Uh, anyway, so the retrospective that was doing quite a bad job on the example that I showed you is actually doing a good job, for example, on the third strips and a decent job on the lower star filtration. What, what are roughly the size of your input complexes? Um, I think this one was the smallest uh, example. So this must be something like 100 points. This is a 3D image of something like 50 voxel. Uh -huh. And uh, this is the alpha shape, which means at least 10,000 points. 
if you compared these algorithms to uh, the like algorithms from like the '60s for Smith normal forms, where um, no, it's very difficult to compare with that because we cannot use the Smith normal form. So the the point is that right, but sort of analogous optimizations that you're doing. Uh, uh, the point is we we read a little. A yeah. bit, sorry, I forgot to uh, the question or the record of the mm -hmm. microphone is if we compare it with with uh, algorithm from the '60s about the Smith normal form. And the point is that we read some of the paper and we read some of those work, but many of the optimization comes from the fact that you do a little bit of row operation, a little bit of column operation, you do you swap things around in a way that doesn't preserve the ranks. And so it's it's difficult to compare because we are doing very different things at the end of the day. So no, we haven't, uh, but I'm not sure I would be convinced of doing it. Yeah. Even if maybe I talk with Michael and he's like, of course we should do that. Um, here I'm doing it, we, we took the best, and then we do it, here I added a uh, shuffle filtration, is a very random filtration, very artificial, uh, but we were just curious. You can see that the retrospective is impressively good on this, highly artificial, but still, okay. much better. Uh, this is the number of points, so 40k, here the shuffle we needed to keep it low, and here the victory strips. Uh, varies from 100 to uh, 400, almost 500. And uh, all the details are in the paper. If you want to read the paper before we put it out, which will happen in something like one month, something like this, I can send it to you. Uh, this file, so this uh, input data come from the roadmap paper, so they are publicly available. Uh, these are also they are publicly available. This is just a, well, we use it something that is publicly available to generate a sample of a torus uh, with that number of points. Okay. Uh, and yes, so you can see that it is unclear which strategy is the best. So there is no strategy that is always the best. So it's uh, fascinating. Uh, here, I'm going to have a little digression on the data type. So when I told you before that how you store your metrics is very important, those are six, uh, sorry, eight data types that are implemented in FAT, so you can check yourself. Um, these are a little bit more special. Uh, these I cannot really explain because it's almost magic, but you can see that it's doing a very good job. Uh, this is a just list vector and stuff. So. Always for mod two coefficients. But this is for mod two coefficients, yes. Uh, is FAT doing also? I don't remember if FA admit different, uh, like Ripser and Goody, they do admit different coefficients. Um, yeah. yeah so this I data type, uh, I'm just wondering if those more specialized are more specialized under the assumption of multiple coefficients. Uh, it's not important. I'm not, I would say no, but take it with the grain of salt of a person that hasn't worked in, in this background. Mm -hmm. So I can, I can come back. Uh, uh, you can see the things vary a lot. So I can have the retrospective that is doing a very good job on the vector space, uh, sorry, on the vector data type, and the swap is doing very good on the, on the pivot tool, but it's not good in this. And the reason is that here, um, there is a little bit of magic going on, but the point is that they are not stored in a way that is easy to compute the size of the vector. So it's easy to retrieve and change them, but it's not easy to understand the size, which means that for operation like swap, where we need to check the size quite constantly, it's very bad because you need to convert and convert back. Okay, okay very good. Uh, yes. So now I think I'm going to talk about the last thing. It was it was quite heavy with all the different information, but I'm going to still talk about, some about something about complexity. So as I told you at the beginning, the complexity is, is cubic, so it's, uh, uh, it's the same of the Gaussian elimination, and for a long time we didn't know any better. We didn't know any better. Uh, what we knew is that in practice things get almost linear. So it is very efficient, this, this algorithm. 
but still we had no clear idea why. So I'm going to define a click filtration, which is a filtration where I add a simplex as soon as I can. So as soon as it has all the boundary, I'm putting it there. For example, the virtual restrict filtration. Then, I, for this special type of filtration, we have that the boundary matrix, the one boundary matrix, and then if you order correctly, also the higher, they have this weird shape. I mean, it's not weird, but it's staircase. And this is interesting because the, all the columns that are the first one in this staircase, they don't get changed during the reduction because they are the very first one with this pivot. Okay. So I know that these columns they stay sparse during the reduction. And what I also know is that everything else is going to be called a critical pivot, which is a pivot that it was, sorry, this is the original, um, this is the original matrix, and then I do the reduction, so now I'm adding this column to this column. I'm going to find a pivot that it was not there at the beginning, and I'm going to call it critical because I needed to do some operation. Actually, the reason why I call it critical is that if I have a critical pivot, I know that I have a new bar, okay? Because these one, they are not really going to be, but the, I have a new bar, which means, sorry, which means that this, uh, sorry, yes, I have a new bar, which means that if I have a control on when I can have a new bar, okay? Then I have a control of when I can have a critical pivot. So the first, the second observation that we give in here for the average complexity is that the cost of the matrix reduction, so the number of column operation that I'm gonna do, is bounded by the number of columns that I have times the fill up of the reduced matrix. So this concept of how sparse is the matrix at the end is also important for binding the complexity. Okay. So if I can bind the fill-up, then I can bind the complexity. But the fill-up is how many, many non-zero entries I have, and I know that I have two types of columns. The step one that have precisely three elements in case of, of uh, one boundary matrix, because I never change them, or the one with the critical pivot. The critical pivot, let's say it is a, a row P, and cannot, be, cannot have more than P elements. So if I know that all the critical pivots are very high, so they have a very small number, then I can bound the fill up. And this is exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna use the fact that I have a critical pivot if and only if I have a new bar, and then I, this is the number of rows, because this is giving me uh, the number of the, the bound on the step columns, okay? And so if I can bound this probability, and then we knock on the door of people doing random conferences, then I have a bound on the cost of the matrix reduction. This is a general statement that is valid for all click filtration. And uh, so it's here, okay? So if you have a random click filtration model, for which you know the behavior of the bars in probability, then you know the average complexity of your matrix reduction. And this is what we did for the Vietorial Street filtration and for the Erdoshrani filtration. Uh, Vietorial Street filtration, we take uh, a domain that is in, in this case was a cube, multi I mean, a high dimensional cube, and then we sample the points randomly, so uniform distribution on that. And then we have the bound, uh, I think this was from K, uh, on the, uh, when we can have a new, new uh, batch numbers, a new, a new bar. And then the, we have the, the fill up is as most this, times the number of columns, which is n qubit at this point. So this and then the Erdos training model is we have n points and we randomly order the edges between them and then take the click out. Uh, here, the, in the literature, we have a slightly uh, worse bound with, for this, which means that when we take the n cube, well, times n cube, we get that. And uh, this is good because usually the complexity is n, um, n power 4 for the fill-up and the n power 7. And I know for sure that this is realizable for the, the training. If you can, to me, with an example of 
worst case complexity for uh, Vitor distributed set, I will be very curious because I spent some time thinking about it and I haven't managed yet. So I don't know if you want to think about something during the summer. I'm confused. I would, yeah. I would have imagined that you would get less than n q because that's the worst case scenario for just a random reduction. Uh, sorry. Yes. So the wait. Okay. So if I have uh, n or let's say m times uh, r, uh, actually, let me do r like number of rows and c like number of columns. Okay, and let's assume that the number of rows is less than the number of columns, then the complexity is r cubed times c. R squared or r cubed? Uh, r squared, sorry, sorry. r squared times c. When I have that, those are the same, so I have this, which is mostly the case for, for Gaussian elimination, or it happens quite often, then I have that the complexity is cubic, which is the cubic complexity that you hear of. But in this case, okay, those are click filtration. Click filtration, if you have n vertices, then you're going to have more or less n square edges, and then you're going to have n cubic um, triangles. Okay? And then you're going to have this one. Uh, yes. So, you should take home from here is that we have a link between the combinatorial object, which are the boundary matrix and the barcode, which is, and this is given by the pairing. Any reduction that maintained that maintain the pairs is valid. Okay? So, please, be, I really like this one, so bring it home. And things can go bad in the sense that we can get to the worst case complexity, but actually, no. Yeah, but if she's right. <laughs> okay. uh, yes. Uh, so, for example, so the Victoria tricks has this property. So what you're going to have is that, especially in lower dimension, sorry, the question is why the row algorithm, so the carbon taking the co-boundary, is much faster only almost in the Victoria threads. And the answer is that, so for any click filtration, you're going to have that, for which the Victoria trick is an example, you're going to have that your boundary matrix in lower dimension, which means less than half the number of points, you're going to have many more columns like one, one, one power more of columns than row. And then when you take the row, when you go by row or taking the commandery or, or uh, taking the anti transpose what you're going to have is that you're going to have many less columns, which means that when you go by column operation, you're, you cannot do much. So here you have to transverse all of them. And here, and if you twist it, then you're going to transverse much less. Uh, in the lower star filtration, this does that. Lower star filtration is an example of cubical complex in which the matrices are much squared. So you're going to have roughly the same number of rows and columns. And then you don't really see an advantage because you're already quite good in the, in the summer case. So that's it. The, the shape of the matrix is basically the one that tells you if it's better to, to align. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think uh, having this sparse uh, representations is very valuable for uh, having represent, uh, representatives for the, for the bar. Um, yes. And, uh, but SWAT seem to break the possibility of reading of You don't read it from the from the final boundary matrix, but you remember when you swap things. And then you can, if you need to remember the representative of the cycle, you can do that by putting, I mean, you, you get high, um, heavier in memory, 
because you need to remember during the competition, but you can do that. All of your variations. For all of the variation, we can do that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Sorry, the question was how do I keep track of the representative? One, how does this square with um, approaches that do things like edge collapsing or um, uh, or oh, finding these yeah. dominated vertices in filtrations? Is this something that can be incorporated in there, or, or is yours more on the on the even more fundamental level? Uh, so the question is, uh, how do how do we connect this with the approaches of collapsing edge collapses and dominated vertices? The answer is yes. Our our work is more fundamental. So what you do with the edge collapses that you start with something big, you collapse, and then at the end you have a smaller boundary matrix that you reduce. So you can always first collapse, or I mean, you can do whatever you want, and then you have at the end of the day to reduce the boundary matrix, and you choose any of these production. So this is actually why we decided to test on FAT, because FAT is really, I take in the input boundary matrix and I reduce it. So I'm forgetting all the other noise that I can have from generating the boundaries, reading the, the point cloud. No, I just want to raw comparison of what is going on. Thank you. I have two questions. Okay. <laughs> but I can't remember the name of the of the page, the number of the page. But uh, I think it was on, on the average complexity in the end, yes. more or less. Uh, it's. Go on, no, 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 no. Here, here, here. Uh, here, it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, that you're trying to uh, uh, express uh, the complexity in a in an output dependent way. So, by taking into account a yes, so sort of number of newborn uh, classes. Yes, so, so it is, the question is if uh, the approach of average complexity is uh, output sensitive, and the answer is yes. Okay. Good. but. Uh, is it something you can do? Is it dependent from the kind of filtration? Because then you told me, uh, okay, I've done it for the Vietoris rips and I've done it for the Erdos training. So is it something that you think you can do every time, but it's different or there is some constraint for... Uh, some okay, so the question is, how, how can I generalize yeah. this approach? So the point is that, so this result, it holds, so the, the, the lemma, all in general for any click filtration. Okay, so I can tell you I can link up easily the fact that there is a new bar with the fact that uh, with the bound on the fill up. Okay, mm -hmm. and then what you have to do, which is what we did, is that we started going like crazy through the literature and see if someone already proved it for us that it is unlikely that we get a new bar. So. Sorry, let me correct myself on the output sensitive. This is on probability, which means that I don't know exactly what it happens, mm -hmm. but I know that, for example, for the for the rhetoric trips, it is very unlikely, like less than one over uh, an n power four. Mm -hmm. Okay, so bigger. Uh, that you're gonna have a new bet you one after a certain radius. So. It doesn't mean that you cannot construct a random sample yeah, yeah, in course. which you get it, but it is very unlikely. So it is not exactly output sensitive, but it's more how the model goes. And there, yes, for any new result that you, you have, you need a new probability here. So you need someone who knows random complexes and such. So the framework uh, is feasible, but you need to, uh, to adapt it. At the certain point, you need to put your hands inside of this probability mess and come up with, yes, it's very unlikely. And no matter the length of the of the life uh, of the of the classes, only... No, no. What I care, so if I have, if I have a lot along the bars at the beginning, mm -hmm. I'm totally fine. What I don't want is that from a certain point on, I'm going to have tiny or new bars. This is very bad. But if I know that it's very unlikely, it's fine. So I can have infinite components, so infinite bars that stay all the way, and they are not going to disturb that because I need to have a new bar. So that's OK. That's Thank you. I think quite a bit of I don't know if we have. So uh, in these strategies, yes. If you want to keep up, keep these representatives, okay? Would this strategy give you different uh, uh, 
homology representatives? Uh, no, they have in the test. Um, Let's say like we, we, we start with sort of the given order of the yeah, yeah. Okay? And, uh, and I wonder whether you know, it gives you maybe some more interesting or di I mean, different... Uh, I think that the swap the algorithm is changing the, the generator. But, but yes, she remembers the swap. But if you remember what but we but swap with... Adding, but adding from two previous and the uh, next uh -huh. yeah, yeah, I would say that you should in general get different one. You don't... I would not say that you preserve exactly the same. And you know, for, for future exploration, it would be very interesting to know which one produces the sparsest representatives. That's yes, that's that's an interesting point. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, this project was started. Sorry, let me advertise uh, Guillaume Uri, that is a, a master student at the Corporate Technique. And both these and the project about sparsity, so the average complexity and sparsity, they started with an internship of him. So. We started with one student and we already had two papers, so I'm just seeing that multiply on its own. Well, since uh, there is a correspondence uh, with the uh, bars in the back of them, mm -hmm. can you bound the, the complexity with uh, like, the consistent topology of the geometric object? Uh, no, sorry, I'm not sure I understood the question. Okay. Uh, this is completely the back of the geometric object. Like that. Yes, so. yes. So can you bound the, the complexity with the final persistent topology? Like, hmm. uh, so the pers I have my geometric like object of which. Parts, right? mm -hmm. So I have my my geometric object, okay, and I want to compute the persistent homology of it, right? Yes, exactly. So. Well, this this is a bound on the on the algorithm. Yeah, yeah, the complexity, but maybe you have some information on. Uh, Oh, yeah. uh, on the persistent homology you expect on the genetic job object. Ah, okay. Yes. So if if I have if I have an expectance on the uh, persistent homology of the object, yeah. is it connected with the average complexity? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yes, yes. So uh, for example, what we had here, it is uh Victoria's strips on a cube, and I'm expecting that it will be similar on a torus. But I don't have the model yet. Uh, so yeah, for either you prove that it works for any surface, or you have to prove shape by shape. Uh, but yes, the the I mean the way we proved that it was someone did a work that it was sort of related on a unit cube, and then we translated into into uh, so basically we moved from the rate from a pixel radius to any bigger radius. And then we had that. But yes, for any geometric object, you will have to do that or find a general method. No more questions? Okay. Thank you, Barbara. We have a small break till. Uh...